Welcome to Make Ready TV. I'm Fernando Coelho. In this special episode, we wanted to share with you highlights from an interview we did with Paul Howe. Paul is a former Delta operator that was in the Battle of Mogadishu, also known as the Battle of the Black Sea, but most people today know it as Black Hawk Down. We're going to share with you highlights from the interview that hopefully will shed some light on what really happened on October 3 and 4, 1993. Now let's get to it and go to the initial raid. The mission on 3-4 October, we had uh, transitioned from going from Idid himself to his tier assets. When I say tier assets, his kernels, his infrastructure. So what happened is we've got a, we got an intel hit that there was a meeting. Uh, 22 of their folks, we didn't know probably the exact number. The uh, snitch, the best way I can describe him, alerted on the wrong building. He was scared getting close to the target building. So what he did is we planned, went in, planned the target building. And we went out to the Burj, getting ready to launch. We called us back in. Said the snitch alerted on the wrong building. We went to the right building, looked at it, planned that building in a rapid manner. Went back out, made sure the pilots knew the building where we were going to drop us off. And then, then we got the code word to go. So we launched the package, about 17 Burj, and we flew a pre-planned route. The pilots had planned the routes, looking at uh, different uh, environmental factors to get there. Uh, quietly, we'll say. And so what ends up happening, we fly the route. We came in on target. The, uh, there was no fire initially from the uh, gunships, which tells us there was no active threats on the ground. So they peeled off, went their directions, and we came in and landed with the Little Birds. Seeing it was a multi-story building, what I want to do is get the entire structure locked down first. So there was no gunfire, so it's a non-verbal communication. I knew they didn't have any problems. So I said, anybody clearing upstairs? She said, no. So I went and launched, took my team, and started working my way up the stairs. And as we came out on the roof, we took fire from a concrete lattice probably two blocks away. It's an it's a ornamental work on top of a building. You could tell it was an AK by the muzzle flash. Uh, myself and another uh, operator broke right. Two of them broke left. The guys left and made the shots on them. I yelled at the guys, don't break the visual plane of the, the roof. What would happen is, if we are going to get shot at from one blocking position, we could get shot at from another. And when I say don't break the visual plane, don't let them see you. What happens is that they hear a muzzle flash or see a muzzle flash, they may assume it's the enemy and they may shoot at us. Well, it happened. M60 machine gun cut loose on us and he was chewing up the back of a wall uh, that was leaning up against and you could see from the overhead footage, the wall just getting torn apart. I could tell it was an M60. Got on the radio, called the Salt Force Commander. I said, hey, tell the block positions, quit shooting at the target building. I said, it's us up here. We're suppressing bad guys that are shooting at us and shooting at them. Uh, stop shooting your weapons at the target building. During that time frame, I remember looking out the window and I could actually saw the CSAR bird, which will come into play later, the combat search and rescue bird, that was the, the Black Hawk had crashed. I missed that during part of this action. And what happened is a bird had come in and dropped people right on that site. And what I was doing, I was watching people. I thought it was a ranger blocking position. They were out late. But it was actually the combat search and rescue bird. They were roping people right on the site where that bird had crashed. That bird took an RPG right in the tail. The pilot, to his credit, phenomenal guy, held the bird let everybody get off the bird. I was watching shards of metal shoot out, out of the tail. And uh, he held the bird steady, let people get off the ropes, limped that bird, you know, nosed it, and then took it back to base, crash landed it, got in another bird and kept flying again. I said, that, that's, that's, that's the caliber of those pilots. I didn't know at the time that was the, the first crash Blackhawk. It had crashed sometime between when we cleared the building and then what had happened is uh, that bird, there was no dust, no dirt. The pilot shut down all the fuel. You couldn't see it after that. There was no dust cloud, no signature. So the call came a few minutes later of, okay, we got a Blackhawk down. We got to go on foot to get to that Blackhawk. So what ended up happening is we started getting a plan together to move on foot. We waited for the convoy to come in to pick up all our prisoners. So the convoy linked up with, with us. We were going to go on foot now as part of Rangers, us as a component or package on the ground to move and secure that Blackhawk that was down. 
One of the things about the movie that I did like was the violence of action. It did portray a good violence of action for a short amount of time. What happened is when we started getting shot at by the AKs, they started escalating. Uh, what they would do is they would actually cache their weapon systems in certain spots, which means like a house or building. When the call came and they needed to attack us, they would go to those spots, get their weapon systems, they would assemble on an, an intersection, they'd come and hit us. So what happens is it started with AKs and then it started escalating to RPGs, rocket propelled grenades. Generally an RPG, it's, it's a very simple weapon. The grenade will go 1,000 meters and detonate to generate 900 to 1,000 meters and then explode. So, but they're good for anti-armor, they're anti-personnel, they'll work on vehicles, they'll work on helicopters if you shoot enough. So what happens is think about a small AK starting, the rumble getting bigger, more AKs coming to the fight, more people bringing weapons, RPGs starting to come now, shoot through the air, trying to hit helicopters. What, would, what had happened is we'd put snipers in the helicopters. Snipers did a phenomenal job. In the first few minutes, they probably killed 100 people that were trying to attack us. They kept them off our backs. Make Ready TV is brought to you by FNH USA, Smith & Wesson, TNVC, and Pro Ears. Now that Paul reviewed what happened at the initial building, let's go back to Paul Howe as he reviews what happened next. We'd asked for armor from day one. Uh, again, we would used armor before uh, operations. It, worked, it works great. We know how to work it. Uh, the problem is, it goes back to Les Aspen, said, nope, here's what you got. Uh, here's what you got to do the mission with. The Humvees, they come, and that day, they're unarmored. There was no, you had to up-armor them. When I say up-armor, you had to improvise the armor. Uh, if you're worried about uh, landmines, you'd put sandbags on the floor. If you would had extra body armor, you might pad the walls with body armor or chicken plates or Kevlar to keep bullets from coming in. Otherwise, they're just like a thin-skinned car. They don't stop bullets. So you had to enhance them through whatever means you had on site there. It could be sandbags, it could be extra Kevlar, body armor, and put them in the sidewalls to help stop bullets. Uh, the machine guns uh, and the weapon systems up top, what happens is there's no real protection plate. There's a, there's a guy exposed working that weapon system that's got a chicken plate on. When I say a chicken plate, a ceramic plate to stop rifle bullets. He's got a helmet, but that's it. He's in the open air. The problem is you may be engaging one guy, a whole bunch more people can shoot at you. So what you have basically is speed is your security to get through these situations. Move fast, shoot hard. Part of the other problem it goes back to is maybe the chain of command needs to look at it and say, okay, if we don't have this, it won't be a very successful mission. We'll start crashing helicopters. So either call off the missions or say, give us this package. Because the package, the Spectre gunship uh, can do great things. The Somalis were deathly afraid of it. Uh, it can, we wouldn't have to fly helicopters around it. We could hunker down in that building, do an Alamo option, what I call it. Or we just stay in there and say, kill everything outside it. And then when they're done messing around, we'll, we'll walk out or we'll bring an armor to get us. So there's a lot of options out there you can do, but you got to have somebody supporting the troops here. So we asked for it. The administration said, no, you can't have it. Simple as it is. Uh, again, then the commanders have to weigh, okay, is the mission worth it? Because when you start slowing down these helicopters slow enough to provide suppressive fire, a lot more people can shoot at you. As far as coming back out in the convoy, it's portrayed in the movie. Uh, they tried to push back out to us, and I don't think it was personally it was a good decision. They put a lot of our support people, man, and I, I think that's just outstanding that they wanted to come out and fight to get to us. Uh, but the fire was so heavy at that time, you've got to sometimes bring in your big guns like your gunships and just slay some folks before you can actually drive those vehicles back out. They pushed towards what they call K-4 Circle, and the fire was so intense they, they had to pull back to base. So they tried a movement back out with a lot of support people on it. Just, just couldn't do it. You would have taken so many casualties they pushed through, it wasn't worth it. Um, we needed big guns out there. We needed to make some uh, decisive calls. We needed to bring in either fast movers, that's jets, artillery, mortars. Probably had a lot of that at our disposal, but again, commands now are worried about what? They're, wor they're worried about uh, uh, excessive damage, uh, collateral damage. Well, you can't do that in a war. What you do when you go into a fight, it needs to be a one-two knockout punch. You need to go for the juggler. 
And you've got to have that mindset. Uh, the problem is some of our chain of command did not have that mindset. This thing's ballooning out now, and we've got to just uh, take it to them. We've got to set a new tone in that country, understand that we're going to kill you wholesale if you mess with us. But we never put that point across. This day we did uh, estimates that we killed over 1,000 people with light weapons, but we hadn't uh, sent a good message to them. During this battle, we should have brought in some, uh, some more assets. The problem with bringing in 10th Mountain to do gun runs, if we haven't worked with their helicopters before, we don't know their safety parameters or their, their uh, accuracy of their weapon systems, uh, it, it can get dangerous. You can get fratricide, which is basically soldiers killing other soldiers. So, again, that, that's where you don't want to bring in mixed apples and oranges. What you're fighting is a G, a gorilla, and a loincloth, AK, two mags, you know, and uh, pajamas. He can run circles around you. You're wearing, you know, 70, 80 pounds of gear. You've got to get there in position before he does, otherwise you're going to fight him out of the position. So we start moving this formation down, and it almost seemed like a lockstep formation where the, the commander, the Ranger Company commander, was trying to move them in a certain mechanical fashion. The problem is you can't do that. You just got to keep taking ground. If there's nobody there, you got to push forward. So we started moving, and what would happen is we'd have multiple teams ahead of us, Rangers, and maybe one or two of our own teams, and we'd have rounds bleeding through the front, which means bad guys shooting is coming through all of the teams that may hit the 415. You know, somebody may go down. One of my vivid uh, memories is, you know, a guy gets hit, he goes down, I believe it was a leg wound, and everybody stops to treat him. And the, the, the key is we got to keep pushing forward because let the medic handle that, and then we push forward, find out what shot him, and then put rounds into them. And that stops that, that fire. Now let's go back to Paul Howe and continue with the story. It didn't seem like the guys up front were putting enough fire, 12 o'clock or direction of travel, to keep the incoming fire from coming in. So guys were getting frustrated. We ended up, uh, I went from left side of the street, eventually as we're getting close to the right side. And what happened, I looked over a wall, there's a small in the yard, he's bleeding heavily, moaning. Um, Somebody uh, serviced him, shot him, and then I, I looked left up this alley, and it was actually a street, but it, it narrowed down, kind of went uphill, and I, couldn't, I could see the crown of the hill, and it dropped down. I watched a little bird come from right to left, and when little bird kicked smoke, when I say kicked smoke, he threw a smoke grenade, and actually I think pushed it off of his, with his foot, and what ended up happening is I go, boom, I knew that's a crash site. So what I did is I said, tell the assault force commander on me, and I started moving down that street, on the left-hand side, other teams started following me. They got on the other side of the street, and we started pushing down towards the bird. Make ground. So, saw that. We got up to the next intersection. What happens is we launched across. As we punched across the next intersection, we got up to, we could start seeing rangers in there, a blocking position, or, or what we call a battle position. We looked to the right, down an alley, and you couldn't get to almost right on line with it. We could see the Black Hawk upside down. No smoke no uh, dust, no debris, but we could see the fire coming down. And it was in an alley off to our right. Two of my guys launched right across the street. There was a ranger blocking position there. So they went ahead and started reorienting their weapon systems because we were seeing fire come from the alley like this, skimming down the walls. And I could watch the soldiers over here. What they were doing is they're putting up little plates out of the helicopter. What they were doing is using them as shields. They're trying to evac the bird. Uh, you know, down to another building and they were basically providing fire support or you know la launching rounds or shields for those guys moving people out. Uh, it, it was a lot of chaos going on at that point. All right what happens on the initial move when we pulled out we've got this long formation with Captain Steele and so what happens is he's probably up front here we're in the middle. I see the action here I start moving this direction here all we did was pull the center out of the formation and attack in a different direction. Once we pulled out of the formation and started pushing forward, we automatically just key off each other. It's, just, it's one of those things we're used to working around, it's nonverbal. There's so much noise where you can't comprehend with the machine gun fire going off, people shooting next to you, RPGs coming and exploding, that I can be yelling from uh, across the street to another person, they can't hear me. Uh, it goes to visual. So auditory, auditory exclusion comes, you know, sets in. Uh, I actually used to go to combat with earplugs in because I can always pull one out at night and I can hear the bad guys. But if I'm tone deaf at night, then I can't hear the bad guys coming. So what we started doing, moving down the street, pushing forward, uh, buying territory, simple as it is, uh, in a rapid manner. At what point the Rangers uh, followed us, I don't know. Uh, there was no different than the movie. There was no discussion with Captain Steele. We had places to go, things to do, we got there. 
So we started moving, pushing forward. We became the point element for the moving element. It's simply what we did. So Captain Steele pulled up, and he came to that position that I dictated on the map, that first position. That's where his final position was there. But the key was if we didn't get to the bird, we'd have two separate perimeters. That had been un un unacceptable that night. Probably one of those perimeters would have been overrun. So we got everybody in the package all the way to the bird. Was, that's what the mission was at that point, secure the bird. Why? The pilot's bodies were crushed, trapped in the bird. We couldn't get them out. We needed uh, quickie saws, you know, straps, things like that to pull them out. Didn't have them on site with us. So we have to bring those in the next morning. So we got there. The fire was intense at that point. Uh, the movie is a good depiction of it. Uh, very intense for about 30 minutes to, you know, say an hour or two. Like, you lose track of time. But what ends up happening is we start pulling people into the different positions. We pulled uh, a second team. I had my team and another uh, special ops team, our sister team, that came into the CP. Some other folks filtered across the street, but it was a composite. There were a few rangers, um, one of our medics. But when you put one person in and they try to run everything, you can't work it. Especially if I'm, if I'm uh, working a battle position and I'm watching down this street, that street, and that street, all at the same time, there's three different things happening. My mind can't process the information. What I need is those fire team leaders running those fire teams. When a lieutenant tries to do it, he can't do it. Lieutenant has limited experience. He's an officer. He, he is a short cut of the system as far as tactics, techniques. Um, those kids could have been moved five feet to a doorway, had good cover, laid down just effective fire. Instead, he put them in a straight and undefensible position. Um, and what happens at that point, they stayed there because they're good soldiers, and they got hit. And so uh, that's unacceptable. And so early on, the problems we brought up, you know, the Ranger Company commander deemed it, I don't know if he's trying to get these lieutenants on a job training in a combat zone, which is unacceptable. I got to tell you, being there for the interview, it was really overwhelming, not just for me, but for the entire crew, hearing what Paul had to say. Well, let's continue. Let's go back to Paul. We started getting the word on the convoy, the actual relief convoy coming in. We didn't know who was coming, where they're coming from. Turns out uh, we had a, one of our personnel was walking point for this armored column, uh, Lieutenant Colonel good man. When we heard that over the radio, it was kind of like a sigh of relief because we know so many fire element, if they decide to push through, they're going to get in. You don't know about conventional army forces. They had got the Malaysians together driving the vehicles. They would filled the, the vehicles with 10th Mountain troops and then they started walking this convoy into us to do a link up. Very dangerous situation, especially at night because if you get enemy between you and the convoy, the convoy's got lots of big guns. They can bleed over into you. They can induce casualties and things like that. What we end up doing is I throw in strobes away from my building so they can link up IR strobes. And so what ends up happening is they bring this package in. It's just getting light. And so now we've got a whole nother element we've never worked with before deploying on our site. You know where, where anything's at, where the threats are. So we've got guys that are moving up different positions. They're repositioning vehicles. We're trying to get guys off the street. I got soldiers from 10th Mountain that are lined up like ducks outside our position. Uh, position we took fire from them. The guy got killed the other day. So we're pulling them into rooms and hey, stay off the streets. And one of their commanders ran from his armored vehicle, screamed to another armored vehicle, you work for me, you don't work for them ran back to his vehicle, locked himself in. That was his extent of leadership on the site. I was more scared of the conventional forces right there than were the Somalis. The order I got for movement was follow the armored vehicles back to National. And generally that wasn't a good, didn't know where National was, but I can follow an armored vehicle. So I got my guys together. At that point, I'm, I've got one in there. I took the medic under my wing and we started moving as a package back to National. And what we do is we fire and maneuver, just like we, we went to the site, fire and maneuver out, back to the same area, back past the target building, back down in front of the Olympic Hotel, back to where the Humvees. What they did is they left armor back at the National, they left the Humvees back at National, they brought the hard armor into us. So we're firing a maneuver in between these vehicles, and, and vehicles are bullet magnets. And what happens is they're big things that are easy to shoot at. Uh, Malaysians appreciate what they did. They were great guys, they were scared to death. Um, Came by the target building, an RPG came from the target building, blew up on one of our teams about half a block ahead. Uh, ruptured one of the medic's eardrums, a uh, little cut, they kept trucking. I went up to the armored vehicle, I'm beating on the glass, I'm saying, shoot the target building, shoot the target building. The driver was so scared he wouldn't look at me. He just like focused ahead. I'm going, oh, this ain't going to be good. For some reason, the convoy got split. Half went to Packy Stadium 
And then as the movie portrays, we actually went with, uh, I don't know, three, four vehicles to a place called Newport. Went into this spot and a Blackhawk came and picked us up. But during this, we're crossing a no man's land, it's like Mad Max, and all of a sudden we cross a green, lobe, green line into another tribal area. What happens in this green line is people there, umbrellas, waiting for the, you know, the bus and stuff like that. I got guys throwing flashbangs at them, and I got to go cease fire, cease fire, another tribe. Let's not piss them off. You know, it, not everybody hates us in this world. And so we go weapons tight, and we launch back to Newport. We get accountability of our folks. Black Hawk comes in, picks us up. We go back to base. A lot of folks don't understand the, the concept of not leaving a, a fallen comrade, whether it be he alive or dead. We just don't do that. We've, we've worked with the uh, task force people so long, the pilots. If, if I, I know if I called them, they'd come to get me. No matter what, uh, you know, if had to fly through to get to me, uh, they would do it. They'd be there. So we, we owe them that much respect. Um, Somalis have a disregard for, you know, human life, and they have a, and also desecrating uh, Americans, as you saw in the video, uh, Americans drug in the streets. We weren't going to let that happen. So, uh, would I kill people uh, to, to get our bodies back? You bet. Uh, would I stay on site? That's what we did. We stayed there and, uh, and held the site until we had the, uh, the tools and uh, the equipment to get the pilots' bodies out. Make Ready TV is brought to you by Brownells, The Sig Academy, Rand Innovations. Battle Comp Enterprises and Core Bond. I've had the pleasure of working with Paul for a few years now, and this interview was really special for me and the crew. If you'd like to see the full interview, just go to our website at makereadytv.com, sign up for a subscription, or get the DVD Blu ray combo. Thanks for joining us. See you next week. The Make Ready DVDs are available from brownells.com.